Dr. Ross McKinney. One word uh, after visiting with him on the phone, I have one word that I think sums, sums up him up in my mind. I didn't, I hadn't had a chance to meet him until tonight. I had a delightful conversation with him. Curiosity. That's where Ross is coming from. One word description. He was curious about a lot. Uh, as a child growing up during the Depression in Texas, he was an airplane geek. He loved airplanes, uh, and that's what he wanted. He wanted to be a naval aviator. He joined the Navy at the age of 17, and he told me he, he was worried the war was going to get over before he had a chance to be part of it, so that's why he uh, enlisted at 17. Uh, he didn't become a naval aviator, but he did uh, end up as an ordnance mate flying, uh, flying in the rear seat. And then the Navy asked him if he was interested in going to college. And he said, sure, and they were going to pay for it. Uh, and they said, well, you've got three choices for a major. You can major in something in the medical field, accounting, or civil engineering. And he said, okay, I'm going to choose civil engineering. So that's what led him on the path, civil engineering. Uh, graduated from SMU and then went on to MIT, as you know, uh, to get his master's and his doctorate. Uh, and he chose sanitary engineering because uh, MIT had, had really the, the premier program, and that was a new technology that he said, you know, this is, I can get on the ground floor of this technology, and that's his curiosity took him over again, and that's why he went into sanitary engineering. He was really curious about the biochemical aspects of uh, waste treatment, and they were just beginning to be known, and so he wanted on the ground floor of it. Uh, while he was studying at MIT, this is about 1950, he was curious about that newfangled thing called TV. There was a place in Boston that actually you could buy a kit to make your own TV. And so that's what Ross did. He bought a kit and put a TV together. And, and he told me that he didn't have it in his room. He lived in a room uh, you know, owned by some people in a house, rented out this room. Didn't have the TV in the room. He had the TV in, in their, their living room. Uh, and they loved watching wrestling uh, on the TV. <laughs> But uh, I thought that was uh, kind of interesting. Here he is, civil engineer, could have been electrical engineer if he built a TV, right? Uh, when he finished his doctorate, at MIT asked him to stay on to teach, and he did, and he, he really enjoyed that aspect of the engineering, really enjoyed the uh, interaction with the fun. He told me he always wanted to have fun, uh, and so he brought that enthusiasm to the classroom, okay? And he also wanted to learn about everything, everything, you know, from, from airplanes to computers. Uh, to TVs, uh, and so it was, I want to understand the whole part of this process. And that's the enthusiasm and the fun that he wanted to share in the classroom, that his, uh, uh, his students would, uh, you know, would get to enjoy that fun and be able to understand everything. I'm curious, how many here tonight were uh, students of Ross? Wow, look at that. I mean, there are, there are a bunch of hands. You can't see them. Yes. In 1960, one of the senior professors at MIT uh, was on a government-sponsored committee, and he was asked to go to KU to audit their uh, sanitary engineering program uh, because KU had just recently lost a couple of professors, and uh, they had some funding to build, uh, to build a research lab and facility, but they were a little worried about, okay, we don't have any professors here, is this the right thing to do? But the professor came back uh, to Boston and told Ross, you need to apply to be a professor at KU because they need somebody like you and it's to be well funded with, with the lab team. Uh, KU didn't recruit him, but his professor called KU and said, you know, you should hire this guy uh, because he's going to you know, take him places. And uh, that's, that's what happened. So that's how we got to KU. Uh, as his research gave notice, so did his consulting work. Uh, and as I said earlier, his consulting work enabled him to stay on top of the leading edge in technology and feed that back into the classroom and into his research. And of course, his research fed his consulting. So you can see how that circle can just build and build and build. Uh, so that was certainly one of his strengths. Uh, as his research grew, uh, he needed help with data analysis. So his curiosity got the best of him again, and he started to look into computers. And to make a long story short, he built his own computer. He told me he had a Chinese TV now, I don't know where he got a Chinese TV, but he got a Chinese TV and he built a computer and that helped him uh, with his data. Uh, so he was a decade ahead of Wozniak and Jobs. <laughs> right? Uh, 
Uh, he said he kept it at home for much of his consulting work, but his professor friends would say, you know, you're using this computer how, you know, to see how it helps you. Why don't you bring it into the office? So once he brought it into the labs, he said he hardly ever got to use it anymore because there was always somebody else using his computer. Uh, over time, his work began, uh, became recognized around the world, and students came from all over to study uh, and help with his research. In 1979, he got a call, and he was invited as one of about 10 uh, expert engineers to travel to China. This is 1979, when China was just coming out of their, their doldrums. He spent a month over there lecturing to full classrooms uh, of professors from all over China coming to learn about him. And, uh, they, they knew him, they wanted to learn more about uh, what he knew and, and because they had read all his publications. He returned uh, to China five times over the next 10 years, both uh, each time for a month doing a lot of lecturing. So he, he spread the word a lot that time in China. Ross truly impacted the lives of billions of people around the world. Think about that, billions of people around the world. Here's a quote from one of his visa support letters. The environmental engineers consider his development of the complete mix activated sludge process for water treatment worldwide as the holy grail. It is used in over 90% of the world's biological wastewater treatment plants. That was from Dennis Lane. Think about that, 90% around the world. Uh, in addition to his research in engineering having such an impact, uh, he leveraged that work by working in the classroom. And as I said earlier, you know, he had students come from all over the world to learn from him and then take that, that knowledge back out in, into the world, all, all corners of the world. Our own Jim Patton wrote, he impressed me as a professor who truly cared about his students and took a personal interest in their professional development. And I'm sure that everybody who raised their hand a few minutes ago would agree with that. Uh, and then our own Moe Talani wrote, he would say in class that he succeeds when his students go on to accomplish great things. Many of his students became professors, top researchers, technologists, presidents, and CEO of companies. So Ross, I would say that you have succeeded in every possible way. Your curiosity led to global impact technical breakthroughs. You taught students well, and you had fun. Well done, sir. It's my honor to present you with uh, the well-deserved Distinguished Engineering Service Award. Thank you. 